now stopping by here our bookmark booth at the CMN in Birmingham is author Susan Joy Bellavance. Welcome to uh, Bookmarks. First time we got to talk. You've got an interesting background and several different books. Uh, one of the most interesting things in, in understanding you as, as an author is one time you were a, a sister, right? Yes, I was. I was um, seeking a. I was testing a vocation with the Missionaries of Charity, uh, happily during the time when Mother was there. So I got to spend a lot of time with her, and um, when she would visit our, our home in New York and, and in Rome, okay. and um, also she got to, she presented us on our clothing day to the wow. John Paul. So, so let me ask you, what what about your experience with them has impacted your work as an author? Love of the Blessed Sacrament, love of the church. Um, she, people have like a religiosity. Mother had a fire and her love was, it, it came in the Eucharist to her. And then when she went out to you, you were Christ. Mm -hmm. But this intimacy between the Blessed Sacrament and the person, and how does that form me in my faith? I've always been Catholic since I was born never missed mass in my life um, but the, there was a fire set there mm -hmm. and then for me my desire is to take that fire in my soul and put it on the words mm -hmm. and make it go into a kid's heart so my books aren't like mm -hmm. churchy catechetical they're more like if I can make you cry you know in right. uh, King of the Shattered Glass for example it, people read it and they start crying because when you show mercy mm -hmm. mercy makes you cry and um, right. so I think my, a lot of my stories are always going back to the theme right. of mercy. Where did you get into the idea of writing? Was that something you were always interested in, or how did it come yes, to you? Yes, um, when I was a little kid, when, when I was a little kid, I think about 11 or 12. Uh, I remember in second grade, though, my second grade teacher uh, told me this poem was really nice. And I, that went into my heart. Mm. But it's something that uh, right along, but when I got around junior high, I got more interested in it. And um, J.R.R. Tolkien came into my life when I was in sixth grade, and it was all over. So why, why the decision to focus on more children's books? I think that children um, are, you can take a treasure, put it in their heart. They'll forget about it. But when they're old, mm -hmm. it'll come back. So my job is buried treasure. I'm here to bury a treasure. I'm here to make you have an emotion. I'm here to make you have an intensity about something that for 50 years you're gonna forget it. But when you're 72 and you have that cancer, right. you're gonna go, oh. Right. Or even like what that teacher did for you by simply putting on your heart the idea that something you wrote was powerful yeah. and that you connected back to that. Yeah. So in the, in the, you, you alluded to one of the books, King of the Shattered Glass. What's that about? King of the Shattered Glass is set in medieval times when glass was the technology of the day. Mm -hmm. And so the, it was very precious. And if you had glass, you were very important. And uh, little uh, Marguerite is, um, has a bad temper and she's constantly breaking the king's glass. You have to bring the pieces to the king. Oh. Everyone else buries it which is adults in confession. They right. bury it, but the little kid brings it. And every time she brings, brings it, he forgives her. And in the end, all the broken glass, he makes a stained glass window of him adopting her mm -hmm. and putting a crown on her head. And uh, she becomes his because of her always bringing her, uh, right. her glass to him. So it, what it does is it helps kids. The story's fun to read. Right. The parents always cry. The, the kids are getting ready for confession, and it's, an, it's a difficult concept for them. But when they see Marguerite and see what she's doing, and then they see the tenderness of the king, right. it's moving and it makes it, it disarms the sacrament for them. So it's, I think it's an important work right. in that. Right, that, it's a very interesting concept. Also another book, Will You Come to Mass? Well, a lot of people are answering no these days, especially right. post-pandemic. Right, so the reason why I wrote that book, and that book is you read it to your four-year-old. That book is Grandmother's Revenge. So what happens is <laughs> the grandma wants daughter to bring grandchild to mass. They're not. So she reads that to the little kid. And it's all the reasons why people, it's cute, it rhymes, mm -hmm. it's about animals. And the, uh, the raccoons are too busy with their video games. Elephant can't remember the sloth. He's too tired in the morning. So but the little lamb mm -hmm. 
says, just take me there. And you go in, and you open the doors and say, can you find the little lamb? Well, if you look in the front, the good shepherd's got the lamb right here. Mm -hmm. And then the, then the statue comes to life and, and, it, and it says, I love you, Jesus. And, um, and then he says to everyone who didn't go, let's, now let's play. Mm -hmm. So it helps the little one want to go to mass. Right. And when mom reads that, mom's going to be really <laughs> affected by it. My, my whole, I write books to afflict parents. Right. <laughs> Afflict their consciences. Afflict their consciences. They think they're reading it to their kids, but I'm really, right. it's a great way to evangelize the generation that got lost. Right. So when they're reading it to their kid, it affects them. You're like a Catholic H.L. Mencken there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Light of Christmas Morning, here's another kid's Sweet. book. So what about this book? Sweet. It's to show a family what to do on Christmas morning to keep Christmas Christmas. No, it takes you five minutes, no money involved. I wrote it kind of like Elf on the Shelf. I, I can't, I, let's do Jesus. So in the morning, our family tradition is uh, the night before Jesus goes by someone's bedside. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who. And in the morning, you look on your bed. First thing on Christmas morning, everyone looks on the side of their bed, say, is, is he there? Whoever has him takes him to mom. Everyone else goes. We all get candles and we sing him to the Christmas tree. Really? And then we put him on the table by Our Lady's statue in the Advent wreath. And, and we say, Jesus, you are, we are, uh, we're asking you to be the king of this So home. where did this, this little ritual come from? You? Adoration mm -hmm. of the Blessed Sacrament. Right. Yeah, is that where so, you get your ideas from? Yes. Okay. And so, and so what it is, is it's this honoring of Christ into your home. Mm -hmm. We sing, we all cry. We're singing through the house mm -hmm. in our pajamas, you know, on the way. And, and then you're the first gift of Christmas. Now we're going to open our other gifts. Mm -hmm. But you know, no one is like looking at the tree. Right. They're, they're having a moment mm -hmm. that takes five minutes that makes all of Christmas change right. for them. Gives you a new perspective. Yes. Yeah. And simple new and context. free. and. Right and uh, because it's true and it's simple. Right. And any mother and any mother or any family can do it without changing anything, it takes just a few minutes. But I'm telling you, your kids, that next Christmas, they'll be looking around their bedside, right. who's got them. Right, oh, that's a neat idea. Also, The Most Wonderful Rain, this one looks a little bit different. That, that is just put out by Covenant Press um, this week. It is based on a true story. Um, I, I wrote it with my friend Nermeen Kuzam Arubin. It's about her work in Tanzania. And um, she was moved by her consecration to Our Lady mm -hmm. to do this work of mercy. And she goes, she raises funds here and her bishop sponsored a, one of the wells over mm -hmm. there, Bishop Parks. And uh, she goes to Tanzania there. Um, there's several um, NGOs that are Israeli. Mm -hmm. So she works with the Israelis. They dig the well. Uh, it's um, solar, mm -hmm. solar wells. And then there's another group that does the irrigation. Then the Salesian Fathers mm -hmm. have a, a Don Bosco uh, Technical Colleges, um, and they use them to mm -hmm. do agribusiness. So she takes a, a, a village that is destitute, I mean destitute, right. and she turns them into entrepreneurs. Right. She doesn't have to put a well, okay, you guys got water, we're good. Right. She makes sure you do the well, you do the crops, and you get the academics. True and sustainability, you right? Absolutely, and she's a CEO from, from uh, building hospitals and stuff right. in Florida. She's originally, she's Egyptian. Mm. Uh, she calls herself, she is African, because Africa is part of, yeah. uh, Egypt is part of that. But um, she has saved like 50,000 lives. Right. And uh, so you should make your consecration to Our Lady and see what she go. has you she, doing. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> what about another book in the works? The most important, the, the one that I'm working on now, oh, there, first of all, OSV is putting out um, In My Mother's Womb, mm -hmm. which is a 40-week, beautiful, uh, Dan Andreessen, who did uh, American Girl, mm -hmm. um, the art for mm -hmm. those books, uh, he did the artwork, and every page has a baby diary, Baby's funny, speaks mm. for himself, speaks of his own development, and then the uh, scripture that goes with it to confirm it. And then there's a little embryology mm -hmm. swatch on that page. But on this page, there's 40 pictures that Dan Andreessen, art, beautiful art, professional art, uh, that interpret what the baby said. 
So when the baby now has hearing, there's, you know, there's music and a piano and a dog. and it's like, So a little kid can enjoy it. A pregnant mother can enjoy it. A gospel scripture person can right. enjoy it. It goes across uh, denominational lines, and it is stunning. And we need it now. Right? Yes, we need it now. It comes out in October. Okay. So it's going to touch people on all different levels. Right. And then the one that I'm so keen on right now is when Jesus speaks. It's right. uh, and I'm um, I, I don't know when I'm my my goal is that it comes out in December, uh, and it's about the Blessed Sacrament and the priesthood. Right. Well, maybe you'll stop by when uh, when those come out as well. So uh, Susan Joy, Bellowitz, boy, you keep busy. Yes. All right. <laughs> keep up you. the good work and have a good show. And stopping by here at EWTN Bookmarks location at the Catholic Marketing Network is Dr. Joe Mackerlier, and you're with Marion Press, Marian right? Marion Press. Great. Pleasure right. to be here. Right. So what's your doctorate in? History. Okay. So how'd you get into publishing out of history? Well, actually, my specialty from a doctor was the history of publishing oh. and reading habits. So I was well into the genre, if you like. Right. and did a stint as Director of Communications at the Diocese of Bridgeport, okay. Connecticut, under then Bishop Egan before he went to, went to New, York, New right. York, and then now Archbishop Laurie before he went oh. to Baltimore. Oh, okay. And um, have always been involved with people and communicating right. and books. And Have you written any areas. books yourself? I have. I've published four books. Okay. What, what kind of topics do you usually write about? <clears throat> I write about um, publishing houses. Um, I also wrote a book about Jack London, mm -hmm. American author. Sure. My most recent book was a biography of a kind of Renaissance man journalist called Sir Harry Perry Robinson, mm -hmm. whose claim to fame was he had the worldwide scoop. In 1923, he covered the opening of King Tut's tomb, okay. which is celebrating 100 years this year. Right. That's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, how did you, when did you first come to work at Marion Press? About 18 months ago. Okay, so you're fairly new there in, in, a, in, in new. church time. That's fairly new, right? It is. So how many books does Marion Press usually publish every year? We usually publish about 10 to 12, mm -hmm. and we pride ourselves on variety. Mm -hmm. We have books by Marion It's not just Priest. all on Divine Mercy? Well, everything kind of touches somewhat on Divine Mercy and on Mary, right? but we have scholarly books, we have more um, popular books, mm -hmm. we have memoirs, we have travel, we have practical right. books. So, uh, What's the favorite book that you've published in the 18 months you've been there? I would have to say it's Peggy Stanton. Okay. We, we've published two books right. by her now. Right. I had great pleasure speaking with her about the first one, The White House to the White Cross. Yep. That was a wonderful interview, but she also mentioned, and we'll roll into that, that that there was another book, uh, The Order of Malta's Minutes with the Catechism, which we talked a little bit about the show, but people would be very familiar with if they listened to EWTN Radio. Very much so. Um, it's been very popular over many, many right. years. And of course, it's safe to say that the Catechism is finally having its, its moment. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are doing things on the Catechism. Um, yeah, there's some social media outreaches on that that people can tie into through apps, correct. et cetera. Right. The nice thing about Peggy's book is that it's a good kind of gateway. The Catechism, I recommend all the time to people, but it's a big right. book right. and it's, it's intimidating. Um, Peggy, through these short one-minute scripts that we've published, right. walks you through. Right. Um, we have probably the longest table of contents in the history of, <laughs> of publishing, but that's deliberate so that people right. can use it as a reference or they can you know, jump in and out as, as they wish. So let me ask you, you, you publish these two books by, by Peggy, uh, neither one of them directly related to Divine Mercy, which seemed like it's a little outside of your sphere. Was that your decision? Uh, not so much my decision, but it's all about the new evangelization. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're inspired by our two great saints, St. Faustina and her diary, and of course the great Mercy Pope, right. Pope John Paul II. So within the umbrella of evangelization, there are lots of entry points. Um, certainly, um, the catechism is about, you know, right. extending the faith, explaining the faith. Right. Um, Peggy's memoir touches very directly on her experience with, right. with Divine Mercy. Right. So, I mean, Divine Mercy is, really right. covers every um, conceivable sort right. of book and, and genre. No, absolutely, and of course, Peggy's story of having incredibly positive 
you know, renowned success in the media, right. uh, you know, and then to see how her life turned out from That's a right. spiritual sense is important for young people especially to see who sometimes spend their lives getting caught up with being famous, right? Very much so, because she was famous and right. then you know, turned her life around. Right. I also love, she has probably the best opening line of a book I've come across where she says, I was born nosy and then I learned you could get paid for it. Right, that right. She, <laughs> she, she, she learned how to channel it. Uh, speaking of channeling, there's another book here by Maria Gallagher called Mercy's Power, Inspiration to Serve the Gospel of Life. A little more focused directly on the, the Marians. Tell us about this book. <clears throat> Very timely book, as it's the first anniversary of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Right, that's true. Maria Gallagher is a pro-life advocate. She works in the Pennsylvania Pro-Life Foundation. She's a wonderful writer in that she's very approachable. She's a working mom. Um, she had a lot of people inquire to her after Roe v. Wade overturned, what now? Right. What, what do we do now? And as you know, now it's turned over to the states. Right. Her belief was we have to build a culture, build up the culture of life, and it starts you know, at home, whether you're a single person, married, or with kids. How do you spiritually right. focus yourself on the culture of life, and how do you look for opportunities right. to be an advocate? She says um, her advice for women in particular is to be the, take the best of Martha and Mary, mm -hmm. so be attentive to the Word of God, but also seek to right. be hospitable to those who may not agree with you. Right. And it's a very easy to read, practical book with um, right. questions and thoughts for discussion right. after. I highly recommend it. Right. Now, you, you're in the Northeast. I don't know if you, did, if you, grew, did you grow up in the Northeast? I did. Well, no, well I did. so did I. So, in a, very Catholic in many ways, but when it comes to things like abortion and that, Terrible. It's a very pro-abortion area. Very. It's, it seems incredibly counterintuitive, especially if you even think about Maryland, which, which started as a Catholic colony, effectively. Exactly. Uh, why do you think so many people who come out of what would have been a Catholic culture in the 50s and the 60s, certainly into the 70s, would, would, would be lost on the abortion issue? In your mind? I think it really starts in the home with, with the family, um, how, you were, how you were brought up, um, if your parents set a good example and if you really made that mm -hmm. part of your life, we've certainly seen the breakdown of the family. We've seen the pervasive secular culture. That's used as an excuse right. a lot, too, um, that people, you know, just kind of go, go with the flow. Right. It's a constant battle and you just have to have to persevere to keep at it. Right, and especially if you look at it in the idea of divine mercy, I mean, that, that is this perfect opening for people who maybe made mistakes early on. Right. To realize there's a loving Lord waiting to embrace them. Very much so. You know, and, Very and maybe so. take some of that pain away that they've sublimated. Right. Right, Very exactly. So. And remember when you vote. Yeah. I right. mean, the only way to change the, the states, particularly in New England, is, is right. at the ballot box. Right, yeah, absolutely. Another book uh, by our good friend, Father Don uh, Calloway, Daily Wisdom on the Blessed Sacrament, Eucharistic Gems. So was this Father Don's idea? Was this something you approached him about or what? Father Don's idea, it's the fourth book in what we call the Gems series. It's an entry for every day of the year. Mm -hmm. And thinking of the National Eucharistic Revival right. underway, this is a perfect companion mm -hmm. for you. Here are 366 entries, we mm -hmm. include leap year, um, from saints, from blesseds, from venerables, right. all talking about the importance of the Eucharist. And what we wanted to do is that the revival will come and go, but we wanted people to have a right. companion as they take up the habit of mm -hmm. Eucharistic adoration, as they focus mm -hmm. more profoundly on you know, what's in the tabernacle, what's happening right. at Mass. And there's a, there's a terrific variety in there. Some of the people you may never have heard of, right. but all you know on a singular focus on what is the source and summit of our faith. Now we're having this Eucharistic Congress and, and those things and a, a revival. Have you seen in selling books and dealing with people uh, that there is a greater interest in Eucharistic adoration and in better understanding the Eucharist as a Catholic? Very much so, and that, that certainly drives our, our publishing efforts. Um, our team, led by Father Chris Alar right. and our sure. EWTN Does show, Does a wonderful Divine show Mercy, for us every week. Right. <clears throat> always kind of brings us back, right. Right. back to the Eucharist. I mean, without the Eucharist, we're just another 
the storefront church. Right, right. And you know, we are really committed to reminding Catholics about this tremendous gift that, that we have in the church. Right. So we talked about a couple of books. Are there any others uh, that either you'd like to talk about that maybe you're showing at the show or that maybe you have in the works? Well, there's, there's two. One, we have a travel book called The Way of Mercy, um, a Pilgrimage to Catholic Poland by Stephen Vince. Right, it I just won the Catholic Media Association Award for, for Pilgrimage Book. Um, everyone's emerging out of the, the pandemic, mm -hmm. and whether you're able to travel or just whether you're in an armchair, I mean, Poland is the land of vibrant right. faith, which produced so many saints. It's beautifully illustrated, um, pictures taken by by the author. Yeah, we just finished uh, shooting a pilgrimage for Father Mitch as a program that's going to air probably sometime later this year, or early next year. Oh, that's wonderful, yeah, wonderful. So excited about that. What else? Wonderful. Mention Father Don Calloway. We're about to publish. He, of course, had Consecration of St. Joseph, which mm -hmm. became a worldwide oh, that was a biggie, phenomenon right. thanks to the year of St. Joseph. Right, right. Um, we're just about to publish the graphic novel version of okay. it called The Chaste Heart of St. Joseph which um, we illustrated by Sam Estrada, mm -hmm. and trying to reach another audience, uh, we're calling St. Joseph the ultimate superhero, right. which I think he Very would good. be for young people. Very good. Well, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you, Dr. Doug. Joe McAleer. Uh, our best to all of our friends at the MICs up there in Stockbridge. Thank you so much. To get a copy of the materials mentioned on this episode of EWTN Bookmark, log on to our web store, EWTNRC.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316.